Good morning, good to see you all on this Mother's Day, time when we arrive at Art Luther's wedding, the cave Catherine von Bora. I planned it exactly this way. <laughs> if you believe that, you don't know me very well. Hey, let's say a prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we continue to walk through the amazing events of the Reformation, help us to see how this event continues to shape our lives today. And especially on this Mother's Day, we give thanks for Katie and um, all that she offered the Reformation and, we, and, and all of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to tie up a few loose ends from last week. Remember, my role here is as a curator. I'm gathering, collecting, organizing, and presenting things to you. I'm by no means a great expert, but a few things to review from last week. Remember, Prince Frederick dies in 1525. Amazing year. Luther gets married in 1525. The Peasants' War happens in 1525. And Frederick the Wise dies in 1525. A big year in the Reformation, Luther's life. John the Steadfast, the brother of Frederick the Wise, becomes the elector of the part of Germany that Luther is in. And uh, this is a picture I found in a museum in London. This is John Frederick's... Uh, um, this is John Frederick, the son of John the Steadfast. So he will become the next elector, uh, and the elector in Luther's latter life. So Luther had three electors, Prince Frederick, John the Steadfast, no, John Frederick, and then John the Steadfast. And so this is a very rare portrait of um, a child in Luther's day, and this is a portrait of the last elector when he was a boy. Anyway, just thought I'd show you that. Remember we talked about John Buchenhagen, really number three in the Reformation, Luther Melanchthon, um, John Buchenhagen, who's the pastor and friend of Luther. He's the one who will conduct Luther's marriage. And then, of course, you know Philip Melanchthon. So we're tie up some things from last week on the Peasants' War. I mentioned, just to review, how many of you were here last week? Raise your hands. Yeah, there's a lot. Some I see were not. So, um, the Peasants' War is an amazing event in Europe, and certainly in Luther's life. Luther wrote extensively on this upheaval against the feudal system in Luther's day. And remember that Luther was very, very critical of the nobles, the princes, the powers, um, that they were causing this revolt and causing this problem, but he also was very critical of the peasants. He did not believe in violent upheaval. He believed you needed to respect the laws of the land, the law and order, and the rule of law, and he was totally against the violent upheaval. Um, so he wrote admonition to peace, which really is a fair treatment, in my view, and many scholars' view, of the situation. Wrote more to the peasants than the nobles, but equally as harsh and critical to both sides. And But then, remember I mentioned that timing was the problem. So his first writing came out too late. The revolt had kind of started. And his the final response, where he says to the uh, princes and nobles that you need to put this revolt down and stop it. That came out after basically the war had been won by the powers, it being the authorities, and it really made Luther look bad, especially in the eyes of the peasants. Remember, this is um, the statement. But even this statement is taken out of context. He was writing this against the peasants who were forcing other peasants to take up arms. And he's saying, you've got to stop those peasants from forcing those other peasants and it's in this context, he says, stab, smite, slay, do whatever you can, you have to put this down. And this comes out after hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. So it's one of the worst PR 
moments in Luther's life, and, and certainly regrettable, there's much of Luther's language we regret, this is one of those, and we talked about that, but we pulled out of all of his writings some principles on how to be involved in the public square, in public life, so Luther felt you needed to respect authorities, peaceful resistance and negotiation is the ideal. Uh, Two realms, don't confuse them and don't claim that the gospel is justification for violent revolt. Um, Christians suffer wrong as an example and a witness. Um, authorities must care for their subjects, especially the lowly and resist, um, or I, that should say, and resist self-interest should have an end in there. Um, this is, you, you can't just take what Luther said about authorities without hearing what he said to the authorities. And he was very critical of them in that regard. So we tried to pull out some principles for how to engage in public life. And we looked last week at um, the whole executive order thing and how much should politics and church be in. And I basically summarized my view and the practice of this congregation that we talk about morals here, we talk about justice, honesty, etc. But when it comes to how you vote and what petitions you sign, we leave that up to you in this, in this world. And acknowledging that some Christians are going to sign one petition and some are going to sign another. And they're reading their same scriptures. Yeah, I hear that too. I don't know if it's a... Somebody's beeping or something. Maybe it's a hearing aid thing or something. Anyway. We'll move on, so just letting you guys know. Um, so, then we looked at the Civil Rights Movement, and you'll think about Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, nonviolent uh, focus. Uh, sounds a lot like what Luther was saying to the peasants. Resist evil, suffer innocently, you know, but don't take up arms. That, that is really interesting. And you do remember, I told you about Martin Luther King Jr., right? And Martin Luther, that his dad... Edward King went to Wittenberg when Martin Luther King Jr. was just three years old. He wasn't named Martin Luther King Jr. at the time. And Edward King came back, changed his name to Martin Luther and Martin Luther King, and then changed his son's name to Martin Luther King Jr. after he visited Wittenberg and learned about Luther. If you didn't know that, that's how Martin Luther King got his name. He got his name from, you're Martin Luther. You didn't know that. Yeah. Edward King, a Southern Baptist minister, when Martin Luther King Jr. was just about three years old, went to Wittenberg before the war, before World War II, I think it was in the 30s, and um, was so impressed, he came back and changed his name to Martin Luther. And then he changed his son's name to Martin Luther Jr. And that's how he got his name. So you have a connection there. Anyway, I thought this was really interesting to think about the civil rights movement in the context of how Luther was addressing a huge upheaval in his time. And then we said last week that we would come back and touch on this local issue, uh, which I think I'm just going to talk about without letting you talk because we'll spend 45 minutes on this one. <laughs> so I dare, you know, because I want to get to Katie, that's why you're here. Um, but, you know, there's this issue in our local school district of Coach Kennedy who um, had a practice of, he, he, I guess he initially just started to pray at the, you know, 50-yard line after the game and kids started to join him. And so they would, you know, this tradition developed. I guess it went on for many years. It kind of came to light somehow. I won't go into, you know, all those details. Um, but came to a question is, does this violate the school district's policy in Bremerton School District? Which I believe the language is something like you can't um, encourage or um, promote prayer in your classroom or when you're supervising the kids, etc. Um, that there's kind of this stance of neutrality around that. And, and so, anyway, obviously it, it's huge press now and school district is being sued and it's been in national news and so some people feel like well this is just another example of religious persecution that you know we're trying to stamp out get God out of the public life and we're oppressing someone's religious liberty many people view it that way still do 
Um, we, I, we had a mandate where we listened to some of the, a few of the students or athletes of the coach team, and, and that was really interesting to listen to. Other people feel very differently um, about it. Uh, the school district has a policy. It's pretty cut and dry. You know, he signed the contract that said he would go by the policies. Um, so what, what if we took these principles, going back a little bit here, and we apply, whoops, too far. Uh, and we apply them to, uh, to this situation, I just have a few thoughts. Um, the, my question, probably what would Luther say? <laughs> you know, what would Jesus do? What would Luther say? It's of course impossible to note this, but if Luther was for the nonviolent negotiating kind of effort with the powers that be, I wonder if Luther wouldn't say, we'll change the policy. If you have a problem, get public around, go to the school district, change the policy into something different. The local school districts can do that. Now, of course, people would say, oh, if you do that, you're going to be sued by the ACLU and blah, blah, blah. And there's, of course, there's ups and downs to everything. But I wonder if Luther wouldn't say, well, that's what you should do. The law and order, here's the policy. The policy's in place. You need to respect that. Of course, it gets, it's very gray area because it's after the game. And there's the debate about whether he was really, the kids were really under his charge still. And anyway, things went round and round. I, and I think good people can disagree on this subject. I kind of feel that's, that's kind of where I wonder, wonder about. Obviously, it's a very complex issue. It has to do with how the Establishment Clause has been interpreted in the courts for years now. Um, I think we need to keep that in context. I, I don't know the superintendent of schools well, but my wife was a principal in Bremerton. I know that the, the superintendent is a devout Christian man. So, you know, I think we have to be careful about demonizing people, but also, you know, on both sides. I get the coach. I just want to say a prayer. What's wrong with that? And I've listened to many of you who grew up in the Midwest, and your hometown still says the Lord's Prayer before, before football games. Still. Today. So, you know, I guess it depends on the school district and where it's at and who complains and who doesn't and all of this stuff. It gets into a real dicey thing. So, I just want to, I told you I'd revisit it, but think about this issue when it comes to Luther's principles. Okay, respect for the governing authorities. What do you do if you disagree? You negotiate in this? I mean, what would Luther have thought about a democracy? Where, you know, on the local school board, you show up. You know, you elect those school board members. They can change policy. So I wonder if that would be the way Luther would want to come at this one. Um, anybody just dying to say something at this point? Just, you just can't get along without I, I don't want to make anybody upset one way or the other, but I just want you to think about ethical issues in light of some of these principles. And so I thought, wow, this one, okay, I don't see anybody, so I'm moving on. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I like to take these principles and say, well, what would they, how would they pan out today? And so that's my best effort at that. So let's move on to... Um, Martin and Katie's marriage. There's a picture of Catherine von Bora there, classic one, written by the, painted by Lucas Cronut, the elder. So let's, um, this is, I actually took this picture, um, you can see the cracks in the painting, uh, this is the one I took in the museum. So um, Catherine von Bora, let's do a little bit of her background. She was one of the nine nuns who escaped Nimbishen sisters, whatever, monastery, Cistercian, Cistercian, there we go, thank you. Um, and when she escapes, she stays with the Cronach family, who are more well-to-do because of his painting. He's got a son who's a wonderful painter as well, and so they live in Wittenberg, and so she stayed with them. Now remember that Luther here at this point um, becomes a matchmaker. Many, some of these nuns that showed up that escaped, uh, they had family. So they could go and live with their families. But think about it. 
What does a, someone that leaves a, a monastery uh, do? They have no husband. And if their family doesn't want to take them in, they are totally impoverished. They have no hope to survive. So Luther, in his criticalness um, of the monastic life and the fact that people were forced into that monastic life, people started to leave. Well, what do you do then? So now he gets caught up in trying to figure out, well, how are we going to take care of these folks? So some of these nuns can go stay with their families. Their families take them back, but some not. So what do you mean? You've got you to house them, and you've got to find them husbands. So, so Luther gets involved in some matchmaking here. Now, um, most likely, the, where Luther first met uh, Catherine was that since she was staying with the Chronic family, because she wasn't, didn't want to just get married right away, so she was staying with the Chronic family, Luther would go to the Chronics every day almost. And talk, dinner, you know, knock back a few, so to speak, and, you know, and, the, and Cronach would listen to Luther, and Cronach, of course, was the multimedia guy of the Reformation, the way I like to call him. So that's probably where they met. But Luther gets involved in getting husbands for these nuns, and um, he thinks about Katie. It's like, who would be good for Katie? Uh, so, and Katie has a number of suitors, this guy, Pong Gardner, she actually really likes. And, uh, however, after he goes home, after he met, I forget the circumstances, he goes home, and he never comes back for her. And most people believe the reason why. Why do you think he wouldn't come back for Katie? She's a nice looking gal. Why do you think? Yeah, please. Pressure from his family. Pressure from his family. And why? What would be the problem? Money. Money. She doesn't have a dowry. It's, in fact, she comes from a noble family, but was they had lost their wealth and were impoverished, and that's why she was forced to go into the nunnery in the first place. Because they, they couldn't take care of her. And they did not have a dowry to give to someone so she could get married. Because in that day, you had this quite significant dowry went to give to the fam the husband of the person married your daughter. Well, they didn't have that. So so most likely this palm gardener went home and they said, we don't know. Then there was this Dr. Casper Blotz. This is what Martin Breck says about that. But Katie had neither desire nor love for him. She thus appealed for aid, probably in September, to Nicholas von Armstorff who was just about to transfer to a pastorate in Magdeburg. Armstorff also thought that Katie was not suited for the old skin flint. <laughs> and therefore, he clearly remonstrated with Luther. And so this is in a letter from Armstorff to Luther. What the devil are you intending to do, persuading good Katie and forcing her? Luther had to abandon his efforts. If she does not like him, let her wait a while longer for another. Katie had clearly told Armstorff, so what did Katie want? Told Armstorff that she would prefer, if it could be, if, if it could be, and if it were God's will, to marry him. That's Armstorff. Dr. Martinus, or Dr. Domine Armstorff. However, Armstorff remained a bachelor all his life, and Luther was not thinking about getting married at all, certainly not to Katie. So at this stage in the game, Luther isn't thinking about Katie as a possible wife. And Katie, however, is like, well, one of the two top guys. That's who I'm interested in. She's smart. So, a number of suitors. So what, what happens next? Well, let's listen to a little bit of Luther's pre-Katie mindset. Uh, so this is from a letter to Spalatin. I'm grateful for what Argula... Argula, writes about my wedding plans. I am not surprised about such gossip, since so many other bits of gossip are around concerning me. Nevertheless, give her my thanks and tell her I am in God's hand as a creature whose heart God may change and rechange, kill and revive again at any moment. Nevertheless, the way I feel now, I have felt thus far, I will not marry. 
It is not that I do not feel my flesh or sex, since I am neither wood nor stone. But my mind is far removed from marriage, since I daily expect death and the punishment due to a heretic. Therefore I shall not limit God's work in me, nor shall I rely on my own heart. Yet I hope God does not let me live long. So you, I guess we have to put this in context that Luther, all of his life, he could end the next day. So he's thinking about marriage. Well, probably not such a great idea, you know, etc. I'm not sure I'm going to make it, but yet I'm a human being, and I don't want to limit God. So you can see Luther vacillating and struggling here in this quote. Um, Could you remind us what year this is taking place? This particular letter here is actually in like 1524, I believe. So this is this is this is a good year or so before we get we get closer to Luther's. Uh, marriage. So, great question. Um, so, since he's encouraging others to marry, he uh, goes to a visit to his, uh, his parents, and what do you think his parents advise him? We want grandkids. Get with it, Martin. You're not getting any younger. And he is getting pretty old to get married at this stage. So, Incident, yes, they want grandchildren. So um, this is a, another letter to Spalatin. This is in 1525. So this is just a few months before he marries. Incidentally, regarding what you are writing about my marrying. Now, before I read this, you have this. This is his good buddy, and they're joking around in these letters. So this is tongue in cheek. You know, you so this think this. This is not a serious letter. This is two guys jabbing each other. Okay, so, so wait. <laughs> Incidentally, regarding what you're writing about my marrying, let me say the following. I do not want to wonder that a famous lover like me does not marry. <laughs> it is rather strange that I, who so often write about matrimony and getting mixed up with women, have not yet turned into a woman, <laughs> to say nothing of not having married one. Yet if you want me to set an example, look, because that's what uh, Spalatin was saying. Luther, you're saying all these to get, you should get married. Look, here you have the most powerful one. For I have had three wives simultaneously and love them so much that I have lost two who are taking other husbands. The third I can hardly keep with my left arm. And she too will probably soon be snatched away from me. He's not married to three women. He's not having relationships with, with three women. It's like he's taking care of these women. He's trying to get them married, etc. So this is what he's talking about. Um, but you are a sluggish lover who does not dare to become the husband of even one woman. So it's like they're it's like, you get married. No, you get married. No, you get married. No, you get married. So watch out that I, who have not, who have no thought of marriage at all, do not someday overtake you to eager, you two eager suitors, just as God usually does those things which are least expected. I am saying this seriously to urge you to do what you are intending. Farewell, my Spalatin. In other words, don't wait for me, Spalatin. You, <laughs> you go ahead and get married. So, um, so I think this is kind of a fun, a fun, fun letter to get underneath what's, what's happening here. Uh, so, so he's clearly been thinking about it, and he does finally decide to marry Catherine von Bora. And so, um, this is from Martin Breck. Presumably, it was known in Wittenberg in May or at the beginning of June, 1525, that Luther wanted to marry Katie. By the way, if you see Katie spelled I-E or Y, it's because I'm quoting different authors and everybody spells it differently. Why can't they just spell it with a Y? No, just, that's why I need my daughters. Anyway. Unanimously, friends reacted negatively. This is really important. No one was rejoicing that Luther got married. Almost no one. Maybe a Bugenhagen and Spalatin a little bit quietly. Not that one, not that one, someone else they were saying. Like, and Luke, this comes from a tabletop. 
that Luther would say many years later. In order to forestall further criticism and rumors like those that had accompanied Melanchthon's and Agricola's engagements earlier, Luther now acted quickly. On the evening of June, a Tuesday, which was customary day of the week for weddings, Luther became legally engaged to Catherine in the Augustinian monastery with Justice Jonas, good friend, John Bugenhagen, the jurist, John Apple, um, who likewise was married to a nun, and the Chronics, with whom Katie had been living up to that time, serving as witnesses. So he gets engaged, and then he moves rather quickly, and they get married very quickly, which is when the marriage can be consummated. So like I say, this surprised friends and family not so much family, probably, but certainly enemies. Why? Well, think about the time. And by the way, his good buddy Philip Melanchthon is the most upset. And did, when you heard that description of when the engagement and wedding, was Philip Melanchthon there? How do you feel when you're left out of a wedding? It's the hardest thing when somebody gets married is who do you put on the wedding list? You know, we've only got a hundred people. Ah! Who do you, you know, what family member, you know. Well, Philip Melanchthon was in Luther's inner circle and he's, he, he feels left out. I don't know, we don't know exactly why Luther didn't include him. Maybe because he knew that Philip Melanchthon would say, no, don't do it. Think about the timing. It's right after the Peasants' War. All these people have been killed and now you're going to get married. Um, and then um, Frederick dies. And now you're going to get married? Some scholars ponder that Luther waited till after Frederick died because Frederick was still, even though he was on board with most things of the evangelical movement, he was still against the married priest Mary. And so some people wonder if Luther was holding off because of that. We don't, Luther never says that, that I'm aware of. But some people wonder that. Of course, this makes Luther's parents, they are happy. Luther had asked permission, by the way. And this is almost Luther kind of, remember how we've talked about how Luther, you know, later after he came out of the monastery, felt that he had been disobedient to honoring your father and mother by not listening to his father's wishes? Well, now, I think this is like his way to to do penance almost, <laughs> that no, I'm, now I'm honoring my father and mother. I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, so Luther makes his decision. Um, this is something he, during the Peasants' War, he says, but I would rather lose my neck a hundred times than approve and justify the peasants' actions. May God help me with his grace to do this. If I can manage it, before I die, I will still marry my Katie, despite the devil, should I hear that the peasants continue, I trust they will not steal my courage and joy. So he says this in the midst of things. Why does he want to get married? To stick it to the devil? It's kind of interesting. It's not your, I fell in love with Katie and I want to get married. But, well, hold on to that thought. So this is another letter. A grace and peace to the Lord. The wedding banquet for me and my Catherine will be held this coming Tuesday. That is, after the festival of St. John the Baptist. I'm inviting you, my spalatin, to this banquet, so that I may see for myself that you really rejoice in my marriage. Please do not miss it. I have also written to the marshal for venison and invited him at the same time. Please try hard to see if you can accomplish something. <laughs> so he's excited for his friend to make it. Um, he is married on June 13, 1525, and to this day, every year in Wittenberg, they have a great party uh, at this time to celebrate Luther's marriage. I was there just a little bit afterwards, and I, I wish I would have known about it. I might have planned it, because it's just a big, huge party. Of course, Katie Luther and, and Martin are all there. So, so no dowry is a significant issue. Um, we'll get back to that more in a minute. So this is another letter just to get you into Luther's mindset, and we'll get to Katie here now. Indeed, the rumor is true that I was suddenly married to Catherine. This, it was a quick move. Most people felt like, wow, that came out of nowhere. Boom. Why did he get married? I did this to silence the evil mouths which are so used to complaining about me. 
or I still hope to live for a little while. In addition, it's like, I'm going to live for a while, I'm just getting up to you guys. In addition, I also did not want to reject this unique opportunity to obey my father's wish for progeny. So there's that obedience to his father, which he so often expressed. At the same time, I also wanted to confirm what I have taught by practicing it. So now it's not, not just, you know, talk the talk, but walk the walk. You know, um, for I find so many timid people in spite of such great light from the gospel. God has willed and brought about this step. For I feel neither passionate love nor burning for my spouse, but I cherish her. That word could also, I've seen it translated as love her, but I love her. So he's not crazy in love for her, but he cherishes her, he loves her. Um, to give a public testimony in my wedding, I shall give a banquet this coming Tuesday where my parents will be present. I definitely wish that you too will be there. Therefore, since I wanted to invite you, I'm inviting you now um, and ask you to be there if you could possibly do so. What do you think about Luther's frame, why he gets married? We're, of course, 21st century people. We have totally different traditions around marriage. Uh, what do you, how does it strike you? What are, are you disappointed? What do you like? What don't you like? Please. He's really practical. He's really practical. Good. Excellent. Yes, Brent, if you, uh, Lisa, can you grab, you, can you grab a mic and push that on button? Go ahead, Brent, into the back and then right here, Lisa. Gloria, hold up your hand. There you go. There you go. There she is. Yeah. So, please. I think he's well aware that he's been the subject of gossip. Yes, absolutely. He sees the ramifications of this. He is under the microscope. Yeah, or the yeah. Well, he's finally practicing what he's been preaching. Yes, right. That's right. He's like, you've been telling everybody to get married, so come on. Yeah, good. What else strikes you or, or dis maybe disappoints you? Anything? Any, anybody else? Nobody like... You know, like he had fallen in love with Katie at first sight and got married. You didn't, you're not disappointed about that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just not the way it worked back then. And um, not all married. What's cool, what I like about this is I like the fact that Katie had the guts to stand up and say, I don't want to marry that guy. And I don't want to marry that guy. I don't want to marry this guy. But these two I could go for. That's pretty radical back in that day. I, I like that. Um, yeah, Dave. I would never do this. But... <laughs> okay, be careful, Dave. Strike me, it could be a marriage of accommodation. Yes, right, right. It's... That's all I have to say. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, it works. It makes sense, right? Is that what you mean by accommodation? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Lisa, right up here. Did I see a hand over here? No. Nope. Okay, Lisa, come up here to Joyce, and then we'll we'll go we'll go to the next step. Yeah. Um, we just finished reading uh, Luther and Katharina in yes. our book club. Yes. And things were a little different in this book. Okay, say some more. In the book, uh, the nuns go to the monastery. Yes. And so um, there was, um, mm, you know. Some Just shady some, happenings. Yeah, no, not exactly. Oh, yeah. But the main thing was that whenever Luther got into his depression business, yes. and he was always kind of sickly, you know, yes. and depressed, and so therefore they would call on Katharina because right. she was sort of a nurse, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, practiced homeopathic kind of things. Yeah. And she would bring him back to health. So there was some intimate... Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Thank the, 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 yeah. Intimate. There was a connection. So I love There each was other. a connection. Yes. According to this book. The book of is course, correct. It's a novel. No, it's a novel. It's a fic kind of fiction based on history. It's a, it's, I've heard a lot of good things about it. I can bring those two together. It started out as accommodation. It developed into a amazing team. And Luther to it will say, she is one of two, three people that can comfort me in my affliction. Yes. Bugenhagen, Melanchthon, and Katie. 
That's, that's who he goes to. So absolutely, great point. I don't want to say that something didn't develop, but it didn't start at the beginning. And I think that's something interesting. Yes, Lisa. So my understanding was that Katie was one of the last, of those last nine nuns to be Correct. married off, for lack yes. of a better term. Right. Um, how responsible was, I mean, I know Luther was responsible in that his writings got into the monastery and that's why they decided to flee the monastery. Yes. But how involved was Luther in actually helping them escape? Yeah, I have to go back to some of what I read about that. I don't think he was. Um, I, I don't think that he was aware and that he was a part of the plan. But there was some people that were very, you know, committed to the cause that had connection to Luther that were, as I remember. But that's a great question. Is that is that? Yeah. yeah good. Bill. Yeah. Perhaps uh, having project of his own. I'm sure he started to think about that. Wow. So and we're so let's get there. Um, excellent. Great reaction. I, oh, please wait. Just, just the thought, because yep. it would seem to me that um, there would be an element of him responding to his critics. I thought that there would be some element that he's responding to scripture as he pursued marriage <clears throat> and God's command. Um, Great point. So at this stage. We don't hear, when he talks about his marriage, we don't hear as much about that. But after he gets married, he, get, and well, I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Absolutely, he starts to see this as vocation. This is what God intended. This is what God wants. And that this is real, this is Christian life. But did I see another one? Matt, yeah. Well, I think of Hamlet. <laughs> Hamlet? Get thee to a nunnery. What's that? I missed it. Hamlet, the, the line in Hamlet. Get thee to a nunnery. Uh. <laughs> and I, I, I don't think that uh, things were that far different uh, back then as they are today. Well, well there, there, not, not a bad thought. Good, good. I, I want to say, I think that we have an overly, overly huge focus on falling in love. I fell in love with a blonde haired blue eyed gal when I saw her in college, so I'm not belittling that. That is a part of it. There's no question about that. But I also think that that does not sustain a marriage <coughs> for lifelong. I mean, you keep those fires burning, no question, but friendship, you know, it's just so much more than that. And I think in our typical stuff you see in movies and other stuff. Um, that kind of love, and there's four kinds of love, you know, in the Greek language, there's four different words for love. In English, we have one. It's a real problem. So, um, so when we talk about love, what are we talking about? So, again, I'm not poo-pooing, you know, passionate love, as Luther would say, but I'm also saying there's much more to marriage than that. Um, so, uh, yeah, all right, well, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So Melanchthon's reaction, he, like I've already said, he doesn't like the timing. You're giving the opposition ammunition, so this is why you wanted to do this. You just wanted to have sex. You just wanted to have a wife. Many, <coughs> um, Catherine had to endure, and Luther both, that they're just getting married because she's pregnant. She gets pregnant like a month or two after they get married, but it's clearly after their marriage. There's no question about that, but she gets criticized for that. So she's under constant scrutiny. Um, so, yeah, Melanchthon um, feels upset, perhaps, because he was left out. Um, it's going to make look, Luther look bad. He's not in tune with the struggles of the common person. But Melanchthon will get over it, and then he says this great quote about the, the marriage. I have hopes that this state of life will sober him down and that he will discard the low buffoonery which we have often censored. That's what Melanchthon says about Luther. It's like, and I think that to some degree this happens. Uh, so, um, so here's a few statements from Luther. I'm rich, said Luther. My God has given me a nun and has added three children. This is what he ultimately they have six children. 
I don't worry about my debts, for when my Katie has paid them, there, are, there will be more. Uh, we'll talk about how Catherine righted his ship early. It's always my advice that after engagement is announced, one should proceed as quickly as possible to the wedding. Postponement is dangerous on account of foul-mouthed people who are incited by Satan. Friends of both parties generally start unseemly rumors. Because after the engagement, you know, no sexual relations till you get married. Um, I know that what happened to me in the case of Philip's marriage and also um, Isabel's. I won't go into those situations. Only get together swiftly. If I hadn't married secretly, all my friends would have cried, not this woman, but someone else. In other words, don't know. You know, maybe you should pick somebody else. Anyway, just kind of interesting stuff. Um, this is a really kind of fun statement that Luther says later in the table of God. Man has strange thoughts the first year of marriage. When sitting at table, he thinks, before I was alone. Now there are two. Or in bed, when he wakes up, he sees a pair of pigtails lying beside him, which he hadn't seen there before. <laughs> so, a little couple things about their marriage, and then let's get to Katie, too. Um, so, this is the point I want to make. Their affection and love for each other grows, Joyce. I appreciate you saying that. Um, uh, Katie will protest that Luther is going to visit different places because... She knows he's putting his life at risk, so she clearly cared for him deeply and loved him deeply. Um, uh, she's worried about him, etc. Uh, uh, this, this is a great letter. Uh, now look, just as I wanted to give the letter to the carrier, and as I search for the little dish, I see that my Katie, this stealthy woman, has hidden it. I would have searched for it, but I'm prevented from doing this by a conspiracy on the part of our provost and our pastor, who perhaps are hiding it. He's talking about Katie here. Just wait until the dish is freed by Katie's confinement to childbed. Then I will steal it and carry it off. So he's joking around here. Uh, that Katie's, you know, she's starting to manage his affairs. Um, you know, so um, amazing hospitality in their home. They have literally dozens and dozens of people who will be staying at the Augustinian Monastery. They, they don't own it at first, but they're eventually they're granted this property. But um, they, they have all kinds of travelers, students, the poor. Uh, Katie has a huge garden. Um, and in fact, here's an example of their hospitality. Most people don't know this. Right after they got married, like three or four days, Karlstadt, now if you remember, Karlstadt's one of those, he was there before Luther, but he and Luther have a big break. Karlstadt wants things to move quicker, he wants to go what much further than Luther did in the Reformation theology stuff, and they have a real break, they have, they're like become almost enemies. Well, they show up in Wittenberg, Karlstadt's family, and they have no place to live. They have no place to stay. Luther and Katie take them in three days after their wedding for two, three weeks, I think. I forget how long. And they took care of them and housed them. So the, the hospitality thing is amazing. They had a very challenging but beautiful home life. Um, some of the things Luther would call Katie, my empress. Dr. Luther, he would call her. Lord Katie. And queen of the pig market. Because she was <laughs> just so great at you know purchasing, taking care of, buying. We're going to see this in Katie, that she really righted Luther's ship. Um, six children, they did have one die as a, as a young child. And this talk about depression really um, was tough on them. So here's some stuff, practical stuff that Katie brought. The straw in Luther's bed had not been aired by the guy that's supposed to take care of the monastery for a year, so that it was rotting from the moisture of his sweat. He had been so exhausted by his work that he had not noticed it. Now Luther left the household entirely to Katie, about whom it was later said that at first she had little experience in such things. She is reported to have said that at the time, I must train the doctor differently so that he does what I want. <laughs> Thank goodness she did. This is a neat little letter to Katie from Luther on his travels. To my kind, dear Lord, Kath Lady Catherine von Bora, Miss Dr. Luther at Wittenberg, grace and peace in Christ. Dear Sir Katie, I know of nothing to write to you except since Master Philip, together with the others, is coming home. Right, so, 
he'll fill you in on everything. I have to remain here long for the devout sovereign's sake. Longer, sorry. You might wonder how long I shall remain here, or how you might set me free. I think that Master Francis will set me free, just as I freed him, but not too soon. Yesterday I drank something which did not agree with me, so that I had to sing. If I don't drink well, I have to suffer, and yet I do like to do it. I said to myself, what good wine and beer I have at home. And also, what a pretty lady, or should I say Lord. <laughs> you would do well to ship the whole cellar full of my wine and a bottle of your beer to me here, as soon as you are able. Otherwise, I will not be able to return home because of the new beer. With this, I commend you you to God, together with our young ones and all the members of our household. So this is a little bit later. So he's saying how, this is a, what I hear in this is how much he appreciates Katie, the wine, the beer, the great home, the, the amazing place, and that, that he misses, misses things. So let's celebrate Katie a little bit, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. I think she did exactly as Melanchthon home. When I read Luther, I think she, she brought him down to earth. And um, I think maybe it helped Luther appreciate the beautiful things in life, the, the earthy things. Um, and I think that happened. And then we have to celebrate, she endured Martin Luther. I mean, come on. This guy was no uh, easy, you know, person to hang out with sometimes. You mentioned the Depression. I'm sure the novel goes into this. Luther went through incredible bouts of depression and angst. Optic tongue, as they say it, I think something like that in German. Um, and, and she was one that could coax him out, along with Melanchthon and Bugenhagen. Uh, so, she, so that was amazing. She endured horrible criticisms. She was under the microscope, too. She was under the, you know, you know everybody was looking at what they were doing all the time because she was married to the famous Martin Luther. So I suppose a lot of spouses whichever, male, female, whichever, that, you know, when your spouse is famous, that comes with the issue. Um, we know that any leadership position was like that. I think about uh, the way it used to be, especially for pastors' spouses. Um, it's, in my lifetime, some of those expectations have softened around the pastor's spouse, but uh, it's not always been easy to be married to a pastor or to be a daughter or a son of a pastor, which again, I think I've been blessed by some of those real expectations lightening um, a little bit. And so, so anyway, um, she does right the ship. She gets Luther's financial house in order and allows Luther to continue not taking honorariums for preaching and teaching. Luther was just really hard-headed on this. I am not going to take money for my preaching and engagements. And he never got paid for one of his writings, even though they were all over Europe and most things in print were from Martin Luther. And he never got paid. He was not going to take money for that. Well, he was in a horrible shape. I mean, he was hawking his <coughs> goblets sometimes to get some money to make things work. It was a mess. Katie didn't have a ton of expertise beforehand, but she got in there, and what administrative gifts and um, that she had. Um, so I think this is the biggest one, that she grounds Luther. She has an earthy effect on, on his understanding of vocation. Wade, this goes back to your, your point. Um, in Luther's day, what, uh, what was important, what was really godly, was to do what? If you really wanted to be a godly person, what would you do? Enter the priesthood. Become a nun or a priest. That's what was godly. Luther's marriage, I think, helps him with what often is a neglected part of the Reformation, and that's vocation. What is our vocation in life? What does God call us to do? Of course we know the first pillar, right? Justification by faith alone, by grace alone, through the word alone. Scripture alone, all those alones, that's the first pillar. The other pillar that's often neglected is, is the belief about vocation. 
And Luther believed that, you know what, the most heroic thing any Christian can do is be a really good dad, a really good mom, a really good daughter or son. Um, that's the most heroic thing you could ever do. And if you make shoes, make them the best shoes in the world. That's, your, that's a Christian vocation. If you're a teacher, be the best teacher you can be. Um, Luther, I think Luther's marriage with Catherine really helped him appreciate the fine things in life more, savor things more, savor creation. I think I have a quote here. Um, this is from Lola Nelson. Gone was any medieval idea of fleeing the body to free the soul. That there's, you know, the body's bad, the soul's good, you know, that our earthly needs are bad, and, you know, the spiritual needs are good. Um, that was something that was big in the medieval time. Well, that kind of goes away. Within God-intended limits, flesh was good, sex to be enjoyed, family life to be honored, food to be relished, and the physical stuff of life to be appreciated as the gift from God that it was. I, I just think that's fabulous. Um, you know, so when you go home and you have a nice meal, or you, you know, you, you know, you to savor the good things in life, that's a beautiful thing and a good thing to do. God, in other words, our goal is not to get out of creation, but to stay in it, enjoy it, savor it, and serve people within that. Uh, it, the New Age movement today, or it's, of course, not new anymore, but back in 10, 20 years ago, you, you'd hear all this stuff about getting out of the body, out of body experiences, out on the limb, you know, Shirley McLean and stuff. You know, getting out, you know, the spiritual is what's important. Well, Luther would say, no, you can't drive a wedge between the physical and the spiritual. You see how it's so connected to our theology around the Lord's Supper? What do we say about the Lord's Supper? It's still bread and wine. But it's also the body and blood of Christ when you put his word with it. The, the bread and wine don't have to change to carry in the presence of Christ. So, that, so, so I think these are all there. This is a great little letter to link. I appreciate that you also promised to send seeds in the spring. Send as many as you can, for I really want them and look forward to having them. If I do anything in return, command it. If I can do anything, command it. I'll repay you in whatever way I can. Be sure it will be done. For even if Satan and his members rage, I shall laugh at them. In the, in the meantime, I will turn my attention to the gardens, that is, to the blessing of the Creator, and enjoy them to His praise. I love that. I love that. Um, so, I celebrate, I, I just cannot help but think that there were lots of conversations at the dinner table. And the personality that I get, that I hear about from Katie, was someone who, you know, could stand up to Martin Luther, that was a great partner like any marriage should be. Of course, this was 500 years ago. There were definite set roles for men and women in marriage. I'm not, it's, Martin Luther didn't transcend those. He said some things that today's standards would be very sexist and whatnot. Um, although, actually, when you compare them to what things were 500 years ago, it's actually quite amazing some of the things. So he really saw his marriage as a partnership, and he really appreciated Katie, and she really um, brought her gifts. And I think without her, I don't think Luther would have made it in the second half of the Reformation. I really believe that. Um, and think about what happens. When does Luther write his catechisms? After this. He hasn't written them yet. I mean, there's so much that happens. The Diet of Augsburg, the Augsburg Confession, all of that happens after this. I think Katie is a, an amazingly important uh, person in the Reformation. We've got a few minutes here um, before, before we tie things up for today. You know, what are the positive things you see about Luther and Katie's marriage? That's, I've said a few things. I'd love to hear from you. Um, maybe some other, I know some of you are reading that novel or you have read it. Um, what are some other things, anything bubbling up that come up? Uh, Brent, you come up here, and then um, Lisa, right up here. Oh, one in the back. Do you have one in the back? Yeah, go in there, and then we'll go over here. Good. Please. The uh, screw table is what you're reading in the front. The dedication. One of the quotes is, 
is Luther saying the great thing we can do is laugh at Satan yes. and his minions. Yes, right. Yeah, that's great. And there you go with what Luther just said. You know, when I enjoy the blessings of life, you know, there you go, Satan. Take that. Good. Great. Now, since Katie was a nun, I'm assuming she was pretty well versed in the scripture, too. Does he ever write about, like, the discussions the two of them had about the scriptures? Not as much as I wish he would. I, I mean, like I say, I just can't imagine that they didn't have some good conversation about that. And here's why. Because Luther will say that father and mother are the what? They are the pastor and apostles to their children. So... Um, and, if you didn't know this, Luther thought in the education realm that boys and girls should receive an education. This certainly was not an assumption in, in Luther's day. So I just can't imagine that they did. But I, I have not seen many conversations about that. Um, but he, I love the way he kind of just lovingly calls her Lord Katie. And, you know, um, and so I just think, I hear that, but she stood up to the guy. You know, she was a force to be reckoned with too, and in a, in a good way, you know, in a good partnership. Uh, Betty, and then in the back, yeah. Just a couple of things. I think it was Luther that said, if I were to die tomorrow, what would I do? Yes. I'd plant a tree. Right. But, and, but back to the country, and those days, some pretty officers were after them. And that had done the Yes. So, He would just, like, the money would fly out. He would have no thought, you know. He would really afraid to say, well, we can't charge it. She would say, oh. Yes, we can. Yes. So, yes, absolutely. She wanted to clean things up, and she whitewashed everything. He had a fit, and she said, we can't have a fit. It's going to be clean. Yes, right. She cleaned it up, and he would get up, and she just went on and did it. And, and yeah, because Luther did not have good sense that way. And you're also right to say that in many cases, being a nun was a very difficult situation. Okay, in the back, can you see if that's on, by the way? Is the battery sword on? Okay, good. Yep. Uh, Pastor Bill, in, yep. your, in your readings and preparation for this, and in uh, kind of the years and months preparing for this 500th anniversary, yes. has anyone traced any of the descendants of Martin? and Katie, so, Luther and Katie yeah. to up to today. Right. So what I remember reading in the biography of Katie Luther, Katie Von Bora, is that it, uh, it wasn't long until his descendants did not have children and the line died out. That's what I remember reading. And it wasn't too long after this. So your, your comment that we'll probably get to this down the road, um, is the other thing you have to celebrate with Katie is that after Luther died, that's when it was after that that Prince, or not Prince, but the um, Emperor Charles V wrote in the Schmalkald League, as they called it, the German states had bound, you know, gotten together as a force, and he wiped out the Schmalkald League came in and destroyed Wittenberg, and she had to flee and make it on her own after that war, which was amazingly hard to keep her kids going. So, um, but I'm pretty sure, and Roberta, if you want to help me with this, as I remember, that they, they feel that his line stopped. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember reading that part, but um, I did read that they were married 20 years and yeah. he died. And he was away from her when that happened. Yes. They were not together. And she was just heartbroken. Yeah. And um, was then again in poverty because That's she, right. had, she had nothing. And That's right. Okay, so I'll add to this. In Luther's will, and this is good for some of our young gals and other people to hear, um, you know, again, Luther was a person of 500 years ago, so... 
But he, when he died, he put, knowing full well that it was not according to Saxon law, he willed his everything to her. Yeah. And that was illegal. And so, absolutely, they loved each other dearly, and she was just crushed, you know, when he died. Absolutely. And then just for her to go on after this war. Because if, if, if Charles hadn't come in, and she, she still, if she didn't, couldn't own the property, you know, I can't imagine them taking that away. The elector was, and then they did, the elector did come in and try once they got back some power to, to make sure she was okay, but she went through some horrible poverty. Sure. There was one other little thing that Please. I remember reading. Yeah. That was about prayer. She was not used to uh, saying a prayer. She was used to reading prayers ah. in the convent. And uh, Luther taught her how to just talk to God. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Very good. Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Um, Katie's parents actually sent her to a Benedictine monastery to start what she was dissatisfied with and had to treat it like a lot of them. Yeah. And so they, a lot of them escaped and went to the Cistercians, which is where she learned her household skills and beer making. Okay, well there you go. I'm sorry. She was five but, years old. Right, a she was five years old when she went into the... Uh, yeah. Well, we're looking at the rights of inheritance, uh, inheritance and things like that. Uh, during Germany and, and, and Northern Europe and over here, very much recognize the rights of women, but there are places in the world today, especially under Sharia law, sure. that uh, uh, if, if Papa dies, the property is taken from Mama. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's still, in fact, that's still a practice in some places. And it wasn't that long ago that it, yeah. Very good. Did I see another over here? I know we're done and Tom already, and then we'll close up. I just had a quick question. So you mentioned that you know he was kind of urged to get married, yeah. sort of practice what you're preaching. Did his preaching change at all after he was married in terms of how he talked about marriage? Um, you know, it's interesting. I think that that's I'm probably not qualified to answer that, but as I just think about my reading of Luther, he was he lauded the importance of marriage long before he got married, long before. And so he was encouraged to practice what he was preaching, although the powers that be really didn't want him to get married because they knew it would, in many respects, make, make things harder on the Reformation. Did it change his preaching? I think it did make it more real when he talked about marriage. He, you could tell, oh, I've done this, you know? I <laughs> mean, he was more grounded, and um, so I think, I, I think it, I think it was, and I think it lightened him up a little bit too. I really do. Um, as I, you know, the, there's more humor in his letters. There's, and, but but not not all complete change. But um, I just think you see more of that. But clearly, you can tell he knows what he's talking about now. <laughs> so when he talks about marriage, it's maybe maybe this is the best way. It goes from be a theoretical talk to an actual. I've I've done, I've done this. All right, well, we're at the end of this time. So next week, um, we can tie up some threads here. We've got one more class till we're done for the summer on this topic. We'll do some open forums during Labor Day week, is it? No, Memorial Day weekend, and then uh, the Confirmation Sunday. But uh, So one more topic before we break for the summer, and this will be Luther's battle with Erasmus that is the big thing, and his writing of the bondage of the will. Um, this is what Luther says is his most important writing, the bondage of the will. And this is about when he gets going on that. So, so we will take a look at that and a few other fun tidbits and details. Okay, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks to God.